Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever in the world you are, and welcome to the MIT System Design and Management Programs System Thinking Webinar Series. My name is Lois Slaven. I'm the Communications Director for SDM, here with our technical guru, Eric Ferris, and our webinar presenter, Rajesh Nair. Um, before uh, Rajesh gets started uh, talking about um, incubating entrepreneurs and ecosystems from the ground up, um, I would like to uh, just remind you of a few um, uh, protocols. One is please be sure you are muted throughout the presentation. Another is yes, we will be recording and you will be sent a link to the recording and the presentation slides later this week. Three, we welcome your questions. Please type them directly into the chat section addressed to everyone, and we will get to as many as we can at the conclusion of the presentation. And um, for a special announcement, which is that um, the SDM program will be holding a virtual information session for those of you who may be interested in learning about the program. It will be held this Thursday at noon, and you can find out all your the requisite information and register at sdm.mit.edu. And um, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce Raj Nair. He um, is just a brilliant, a brilliant and kind and um, innovative leader, and we are very honored and very pleased that he has agreed to deliver a webinar here. And with that, I turn it over to Raj. Good afternoon. This is Rajesh Nair. I hope uh, you're all in places that are warmer than Cambridge. It's about 50 here, and that is Fahrenheit, not uh, wax melting degree C. Uh, it's a little strange actually speaking on a webinar because I have no feedback from the, from the listeners, but so I'll go open loop on this. Uh, the, what if we can create tens and hundreds of entrepreneurs in a community? You know, how would that change the community? How would that change the nation? Uh, my work primarily was on that topic, and if you uh, my screen, okay, I, I really don't know what a congregation of entrepreneurs are called. You know, if I'm, is it a gaggle or a herd or whatever? But I'm calling it an army of entrepreneurs. How can we create an army of entrepreneurs in in societies? What if we can convert? about 10% of the graduates into entrepreneurs. Imagine creating you know, this large number of entrepreneurs. Uh, it could significantly reduce unemployment, create wealth in the communities. Uh, it can also make communities res resilient and recover faster from shocks and, you know, and disaster in, in certain areas. But the question is, can we actually transform ordinary people into, trans into entrepreneurs? So before that, I'll just give a quick backstory. Uh, I was trained as a, an electrical engineer, a product designer, and an entrepreneur. I joined SDM uh, in 2012, and I got a fellowship from the Tata Center, from uh, a Tata Fellowship at MIT. And the goal of the fellowship was to identify critical problems in resource-constrained communities and develop solutions for social impact in that area. So uh, primarily we were looking at India as the test bed. And I traveled all across India, looked at issues with water, housing, and, and several problems uh, related to those things. And one thing I recognized is that there are fantastic, fabulous innovators and a lot of innovations in, in India. But what was missing? Uh, to make the impact was there was a lack of entrepreneurs that could take these innovations and bring it out into the market. 
so I decided to focus on that, uh, on bringing on building entrepreneurship as my pro, you know, problem for my thesis, just so that that could actually make a larger impact in the in the society. Uh, to analyze this, I kind of you know started with entrepreneurs need an ecosystem, and entrepreneurs cannot survive just by themselves, or at least they may, but it will be much harder for them to survive. And ecosystem, as taught by Professor Fiona Murray at uh, Sloan, uh, has a pentacle of players. That means uh, you have universities supplying innovators and innovations. And you have government creating policies, supporting framework, and sometimes even funding. Corporations can be both customers and suppliers, and they even create innovators and uh, innovations uh, 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 companies. Uh, I think somebody's phone is uh, not on mute. Uh, then you, of course, you have uh, investors offering risk capital. But of all these people, what entrepreneurs need are other entrepreneurs. They need a community of entrepreneurs to support them of and promote uh, and promote the community and also of course as an entrepreneur myself you know misery loves company so you need a lot of other entrepreneurs to to cry on or to, uh, when you need when you need support but but the ecosystem is not just the people it is also the culture it is uh, culture of uh, the social culture and the spirit of failure and i'll come back on this point of Spirit failure quite often. Uh, I think some phone, one of the phones is not on mute. Uh, if you could take care of it. So my point is that we have uh, you know, the the people that is all the pentacle that we talked about, and the culture of of social culture and the spirit of failure. They all form the ecosystem that we are talking about. To do a simple system dynamics modeling of a, of of uh, of a ecosystem, so you know you have a universe of students, and I, I'll come back to why I chose students later. Uh, there are mo lots of them are aspiring entrepreneurs, and some of them even go out and start companies. So, if you look at uh, how many of of the students really go out all the way to the to start companies it's less than 1000 to 1 that means you know less than 1 for 1000 and i've been doing some study in india and i think what i found is it is actually maybe 3 to 5000 to 1 so now when these students start up when the the company they are of course they are all inexperienced entrepreneurs so out of this thousand, one of them raise their hand and say, I want to start a company. And you have some supporting programs such as incubators and investors and such, and they kind of uh, support some of these uh, student entrepreneurs. They, it's hard to s start a serious company when, you, when you're still a student. So some of them drop out. Some of them start after they're graduated. So here is a very interesting st uh, scenario where when you're in a college, when you're in a university, you could try and fail and you still have a school to go to. But when you go out and if you gave up your job and start a company, you have a much higher height to fall from. And it has very high failure rates. Today, Wall Street Journal uh, recently said they have 75% of startups fail and about 95% of them do not deliver projected revenues. And primarily the case, reason is attributed to lack of experience. And if they fail, how, how many of them retry? Uh, in many cultures, a failure of an idea is almost attributed to failure of a person. So it's seen as a failure of a person. So, you know, I can tell you in India, if you try and fail uh, to convince your family and, and everyone else to go back and start again is a, is a, a, a steep, steep slope to climb. 
So now some of these students go out, they do things and start companies. Some of them fail, but finally you get a, a, a bunch of experienced entrepreneurs. So this is a, basically a stock and flow uh, study where each one has numbers of, of students. A number, each block has a number and they flow from one to the other. Before I go too far, let me just digress a bit. Now, as I said, <laughs> you have one out of thousand, you know, taking this leap to start a company. And then you, uh, first thing, we, we could always look at the one, but I'm looking at the thousand that are left behind. Are they there because they cannot be entrepreneurs? Or is it because they have now had the courage and the, and the uh, self-efficacy to and the confidence to do this? The second part is imagine uh, major league sports hiring people who are walking from the street to, and ask them to play. You know, many investors put money on first-time entrepreneurs who have not been trained or even failed, even in a controlled environment. So. What are we betting on? You know, people, the, or, uh, we, are, we, are ha we have high expectation on these students to, or these young entrepreneurs with, who start up with no training. And the third part is, like in major league sports, we, can we go out into the colleges and schools and look for potential candidates and nurture them all the way so that you would actually have much more trained uh, entrepreneurs by the time they can actually start something when they are adults. So getting back to the system dynamics model, uh, this is, as I said, this is a, a flow of numbers from number of students moving to aspiring entrepreneurs and, and such. And you have these valves. And the valves are controlled by external uh, factors such as ecosystem. So an ecosystem can open up the valves more. A, a very supportive ecosystem can support the flow of, of, uh, of students into aspiring to uh, startup entrepreneurs. Then, of course, you have investors. Uh, after all, investors are entrepreneurs who feed off other entrepreneurs and they support them and they nurture them and such. But Investors don't come into there aren't enough people, there aren't enough uh, uh, entrepreneurs to work with. Now, when you have more experienced entrepreneurs and student entrepreneurs, that actually builds your ecosystem, and that changes the university programs. And the universities of, in 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 India, colleges look for a percentage placement as their scorecard. Uh, I'm primarily looking at technical colleges. And imagine uh, a, com a, a college or a university putting out 10, 20, 50 companies every year. How would that change the position of the college? You know, recently there was one private university that produced the CEO of uh, Microsoft in India. And within no time their as applications went up by 30%, even, if, even though this, they had a higher uh, Tuition fee. So that changes the brand of a college. So the universities get into this program. Now, of course, government uh, policies, uh, government wakes up a, a somewhere in between to see that this changes the uh, job market and wealth creation, and they would also come up with some programs. Uh, now, when you look at the whole s flow, the biggest issue that I see are the bottlenecks up here. Because if you only produce one or two entrepreneurs a year, you can't, you're not going to have all the rest of the supporting structure grow around you. So investors and policies and such do not happen. So your growth of the whole system is, is very, very, very small. So my thought was, can we go out and enable the other thousand you know, who do not put their hand up to become entrepreneurs. And how do you, you know, f uh, inspire them and train them to go uh, do these things, try, fail, learn, and, and uh, get into the culture of entrepreneurship. So,
I created a, so that is where I thought I should work on if I really need to improve the entrepreneurship system in India, uh, which was part of my thesis. So I said, let me see how I can change those two valves, control those two valves, so the flow could be increased. I believe that every, each of us has an entrepreneur in us, and it is the key is to find a way to unleash it. And there is, you know, they have it in different grades, but it really doesn't matter if you can train them and they, you could actually bring out more entrepreneurs. And primary factor that changes this conversion is self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is the confidence that that you can find your way through challenges even if you do not have the capability now. You know, self-efficacy efficacy is the critical factor that change that that you need to build up. Uh, and I believe that uh, the earlier the student is exposed to these things and ex gets the experience, the faster she would take on entrepreneurship as a life pla life path, and she'll have to learn and fail a few times, and you know, but that is all fine. So. Now, my focus is how do you change, how do you build self-efficacy in students uh, so they have the courage to go start and, and they have the courage to go fail early. Now, those became my research questions. Questions first is, uh, can I build self-efficacy in people? And second is, can I build can we build entrepreneurship ecosystems from scratch, from the ground up, in places that have absolutely zero culture of entrepreneurship? So these two were my research questions that I went ahead with. So <clears throat> my, for my experiment, I focused on engineering students in India. Uh, I wanted to find colleges that have no Innovate, innovation or entrepreneurship initiatives They've, because I want to see how the experiment changes. And, and that is how I set up the program and I'll talk more about it. So we, we gave them, we taught them basics of what it takes to identify opportunities, create solutions, build products, write up uh, uh, proposals on our uh, business plans and such and learn to pitch. And I monitored their their confidence before and after through uh, a survey, and I'll come to the results later. So I picked 50 students in from each college. Uh, <clears throat> I did it in three different colleges in India, but I wanted all of them to be from one single college so I can create a, a critical mass of students who have gone through this program. So when I walk away, they are still colliding with each other and they are still working with each other and doing something so the energy doesn't die after I leave. And I picked students from all disciplines and all backgrounds. So background is in the sense of their rural or urban upbringing, their language of education because in India, you know, most of the students are taught in, the, in, the, in their mother tongue. And 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 the f uh, financial position of the of the student or the family, you know, size of the family, and all these kind of things, the parents' education level, the several factors that I looked at, and I made sure that we have students from all of them, uh, in, from all these backgrounds, and I did not really care about the academic performance because uh, I think there is a reason why some of the students feel uh, do bad in academics is not because they are not smart, it is because they're not being challenged enough in, in, the, in the academic uh, uh, program that most of the universities offer. I picked three colleges and they were rural colleges, uh, focused on rural colleges primarily with no initiatives, entrepreneurship or innovation uh, initiatives or ecosystems. And I even served, stayed away from large cities just to avoid any influence from, you know, of programs within the city. So created a curriculum. Of, the curriculum basically was designed to build self-efficacy self through three means. One is through doing things on their own. So uh, they had to look for problems, 
create products and you know pitch and all these things they had to do on their own second thing is learn through you know a vicarious experience of watching their peers do these things so when a uh, second in, second year civil engineer sees a second year mechanical engineer draw some circuits and make some write a, com, uh, some code on uh, Arduino make some things happen you know when they make things happen uh, you get a, an, a confidence that if he can do it I think I can do it too so you don't really have to do on your own to get the same confidence and third is mentorship through experienced people who have done these things so I would invite other entrepreneurs and innovators from local areas to come and talk to these students just to show them that these things can be done you know when they were at their age how they went through and such so these three factors primarily build the self-efficacy and it is more than teaching it is primarily individual mentoring that happened and I taught you know I carried 3d printers and PC board making machines and a whole lot of electronic devices and modules and things like that and I taught them all the basics of engineering and they all had already learned all these things but they never knew what the application for all these things were so within actually three two three hours uh, they could actually they were at least they even if they're not very good at what they uh, at, the, at the topic they learned but they actually lost the fear of other disciplines and that was very very important because one discipline always said that is not for me and I, I'll stay on my mechanical engineering or otherwise and uh, I, I've used uh, f you know free, free freely available tools such as uh, SketchUp and you know for 3d CAD and eagle for circuit design and such so they all learned the basics of all those things they learned the basics of circuit design itself you know ohm's law to uh, in you know microprocessors and, and such and idea was not to teach them idea was so that given a problem they have to go learn what they need to learn to solve the problem so i would not give them a long lecture on any of these things so for, it was all an interactive kind of a process and I basically took three things. One is the IDEO's uh, human-centered design process, uh, that is the same as uh, design thinking from Stanford. And I took the f Fab Lab concept and maker skill concept from uh, 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 Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT. And I f took a little bit of uh, f uh, Bill Ollett's book on uh, discipline entrepreneur and I combined them all made my own little curriculum out of that and after all this I taught them how to pitch their concepts and which I realized was a very critical part of their pro uh, learning uh, because pitching if they can stand up and talk if they can communicate that changes their confidence a lot really fast and I had cases where students would stand up and shiver uh, in front of their own class because they did not they didn't have the confidence to talk at the end of the session they were standing on stage pitching to investors so and it is very easy to teach them it is just have to be at you know encouraging and, and such and the students had to make make things that means they have to fabricate all the time so they can have an idea but if you cannot make a proof of concept it is hard to test its validity so I carried, as I said, 3D printers and such. They had to make and fail and break and things like that. And over time, they kind of figured out how things, how to do these things. So uh, the design thinking process, Fab Lab, okay, I kind of covered that. And the last part is I made them work in teams. So every team had, I call the physical engineer who people who can think in volumes weight and movement like mechanical and civil engineers uh, circuit engineers who could design analog processor power circuits and such and logic engineers who can develop code to convert an algorithm or a process you know into automate those processes so computer science basically and they went through multiple mini projects 
and just to get used to the process. So for example, in the first day, I would give them a, an LED and a, and a battery and a switch and say, go figure out an application for a light. For ideate, come back with a sketch, design, and make it. So people had light, uh, a light for a sewing machine or a light that can, uh, on a glass rod that could, put, could be put into your gas tank in your motorcycle to see how much water is there and then it's a different kind of things. But basically all I gave them was a, 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 an LED and a, and, a la, and a battery and a switch and they had to come up with ways to apply these things. Then they uh, took on large projects where they had to go for identify the problem, uh, take it all the way to business plan. The learning ob objectives were very simple. One is go look for, observe things, identify problems, validate these problems, uh, convert them, you know, see how big an opportunity it is. That means uh, for a, from the financial pr perspective or from a, a, a social impact perspective, is this a real problem that you should really solve? Uh, you know, is it a one-off problem or is it just something that a uh, lot more people are facing? And once they realize that this is a problem that they need to address, uh, now when they go into solution ideation, they identify all the stakeholders, how they behave, their interest and influence and such. And they go into fabrication of products and, you know, for prototypes. Uh, for then they go back to the field and test it out and come back with uh, f uh, the feedback. Create a business strategy, you know, how do you get this product to the customer, how much will the customer pay for it, when, who is the customer, who pays and who is the beneficiary and such. And they had to learn to communicate and pitch this idea over and over again. I did this in three places, one in South India, a college with a 12-year-old 12 12 year college with no INE initiative. And they had, in the last 12 years, they had one student startup, uh, then one in the north, uh, which, which is a brand new college that the first batch hadn't graduated. It is in a real rural area, and the local industries were sugar, paper, and such. So I, one thing I did was to make sure that the students connected with the local industry so they can actually real, identify real problems that people want solved. So they did solutions uh, for these kind of industries. And one in Maharashtra, uh, which is a 35-year-old college, and again, in a very rural setting. The data that I collected were, uh, you know, personal information of their age and gender and each, uh, language of education and things like that, family background, income level, parents' education, the rural uh, or urban upbringing, and have they been exposed to business in their life. Uh, then we monitored uh, their confidence in starting companies, identifying problems, you know, how do you for the whole process, for every single step that they went through, uh, what kind of confidence do you have? Uh, it was get, went through, we, we took, took a survey before and we took a survey after. So I want to do this, I don't know if it is. So this is the, one of the colleges that we, I don't know if it is even coming through. Uh, the teaching was very short. Every day we would actually have a 15 to 20 minutes of, of class of, on what we, the objective should be and the basics of things. And they had to learn basic CAD. You know, we would machine out little circuit boards with using a routing machine and, uh, you know, 3D printing the machine parts and some electronics. They, they had to solder parts and, you know, and this is all mechanical computer science and, you know, all different majors. And they're all 17 to 21 year old students. And they had to learn what they need to do. So it's not that I had a long theory session first. So they figured it out on their own of how to do these things. And before then, I knew this was actually students who had never done any of these kind of things doing it for the first time. And the, the, their experience was, you know, amazing. Uh, they, after the, the session was over, you know, I'll come into the results. Uh, Fifty percent of them said, actually, well, more than fifty percent said that they want to start a company in the next few years, either towards when they're in the final year or just after graduation and such. Ten percent of them actually started 
converted their uh, the project into a venture. And you know, I'm not looking for successful companies here. What I'm looking for is I want them to try and I want them to fail and learn why they, why they fail. Lose the fear of failure and come back and try again. Because otherwise we are expecting them to you know, succeed in the first shot and which is a, a large uh, ask on, on them. So uh, ideally when you're in, in college, you can happily fail and you, if you have a college to go to, then you convert and you know, if you reform and you know, regroup and such. So uh, six startups came out. They went to the local incubation centers and some of them raised money and, you know, and such. A uh, significant change in self-confidence was noticed. They all, I'll come to that data. And after I left, uh, you know, I was there for so many weeks. The day after I left, the students, they reformed. They started their uh, entrepreneurship club and incubation, uh, innovation club. And uh, they continued, they started teaching other students. Uh, interestingly, in one of the places, they have even uh, formed a industry liaison where they brought in uh, faculty and students and went out to the industry to see if they can uh, create projects for them and, uh, and such. So this is just a quick uh, result on uh, what I saw. Uh, the, from a confidence from zero to 10, uh, the, the average confidence went up. You could actually see a bell curve you know, before and after moving to, towards the right, and for both for uh, male and female students, the the results were pretty. You know, they both saw the same increase in uh, in their confidence after that. We I took the data from two different places. I I thought and looked at their confidence in all different factors, estimate market potentials, you know, develop business plans, and and a whole lot of things, present ideas. I found most of them were very similar except for two. One was the present ideas and the last one, start business. And uh, uh, the reason primarily is that uh, in, in I did the Trivandrum one first and I was not focusing on presentation and the pitching skills. And I realized that towards the end that I was missing that. And when I went to Muzaffar Nagar, I made sure that I did that class. And as for uh, start business, the Trivandrum workshop was more than six weeks. Uh, I taught there every day for six weeks, uh, including weekends. Uh, uh, in the other place, I only did, the, the class was only for 18 days. And so in Trivandrum, we did three project, full projects, and other place, we only did one. You know, there's a movie called uh, uh, Minority Report where we had this concept can we predict who's going to, who are the criminals so you can actually go arrest them early on? So this whole idea of can we predict entrepreneurs? You know, if you have, is there any correlation between the data, their personal data, and how much the confidence changed? Is there, is there mathematically, is there any kind of correlation? If there's a correlation, can we use that to predict entrepreneurs very early in their life? So this was a, an interesting thought. I've I, I'm not a statistician. I put a couple of uh, grad students here to do the analysis and, and come back with that. So we went through, you know, all the personal information, the change in confidence that they found, you know, in the personal as well as the family background. Anyway, all these slides would be up on this, uh, on our website, so you could take a look at it later. So first thing we found is that there was no significant correlation in the change of attitude to personal backgrounds. So uh, that means you cannot feel that, okay, a girl who was brought up in a large family, you know, of, of middle uh, income level may have a higher chance of becoming an entrepreneur or any such thing. You know, we could not come up with a very, any significant uh, 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 correlation. So it is kind of difficult to predict entrepreneurs from their background. And this is, and there may be some other factors which may affect it, but at least the factors I looked at, we could not find a correlation. So you don't know who the next entrepreneur is. So if you really have to do some program like that, we need to offer a very wide exposure and very early in their life so they have uh, a, uh, more opportunity to, to build up from there. 
In closing, the first takeaway I found is that uh, entrepreneurs can be made. We, it is not something that people are born with. You can actually teach them and train them to be entrepreneurs. The ecosystem can also be built. These students, they created their own ecosystem in these colleges after I left. All I need, needed was, you know, there was no government grant, there was no companies coming in. All I had to do was to inspire the students to do things, and they did it everything from ground up rather than coming from a top-down approach. And it is very difficult to predict an entrepreneur. So if we need to make an impact, we need to do catch them early and have to throw a much broader net. So where do we take all these things and how do we apply it in future? So what kind of impact can you make? So of course you can build a regional ecosystem in a city, college, you know, state, na nation for changing uh, the entrepreneurship uh, activity within a region. We could, we could do that using this. But where else? How about reviving economically depressed regions? So Detroit and places like that where they have all the right building blocks. What is missing is the right inspiration, right, right training, and uh, building the ecosystem that can actually turn the, the picture around. You know, recently there was a study done at, uh, uh, which showed that regions that have a higher entrepreneurship culture uh, recover faster in case of a disaster. And they did the study in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, and they found some certain areas with more entrepreneurial culture, they, they revived, they built up faster. So can we, uh, there are disaster prone areas, can we build their resilience by you know, building an ecosystem like that? There's a whole untapped or undertapped demographic, which is uh, you know, inner city population, you know, veterans and such. How do we go enable them to go take on this kind of programs? And of course, you know, after Second World War, we had the, the Marshall Plan, you know, but we have a lot of conflict areas now. We are spending a lot of money on all these places. Can we change the culture there through building uh, such ecosystems? And uh, I can, that is all I have, and I can take any questions. I have some backup slides, which I will post anyways, so I can take some questions. Thank you very much, Raj. Um, I'd like to remind folks, <clears throat> excuse me, that if you have any questions, please type them directly into the chat section addressed to everyone, and I will read them aloud for everyone uh, and, uh, and for Raj to answer. Um, I have um, a few questions that have come in actually right here on campus. One is, you spoke of encouraging students to start companies in remote areas. What are the chances of these students failing? Are we playing with their future? Okay. I, I believe failure is a very important fact, factor uh, of learning uh, because uh, I tell my students that I want you to fail, and I actually I want you to fail a few times till you get over the fear of failure, so you can actually think beyond you know uh, this conservative, uh, very very safe thoughts. So they need to try something outside the realm of uh, comfort, and the point at which they could fail, the primary uh, time when they can fail is when they are a student. If they graduate, gave up their job and took start up a company, uh, then they fail. They have so many other responsibilities and such. Where uh, you know, and when you're scared of failure, you always make very safe decisions. And safe decisions don't make a large, com you know, fast growing company. So they somehow need to get over it. And and the only way to do it is, you know, they have to fail. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question is, is the, change, is the change in students that you noticed sticky? Does it last or does it die down over time? The, uh, uh, you know, the students I was working with, uh, 
uh, interesting question because over time, obviously, if, you, if they they are not for engaged, they will slowly go back to their uh, normal uh, level. So, uh, in these students, what happened in these colleges? They started on their own. Uh, these eco, you know, they built their own ecosystem that helped them uh, keep some of the change, you know, permanent. At least I wouldn't say permanent. At least longer. Uh, but the faster the colleges, uh, the university, and the government and such get involved, uh, the faster they can build the ecosystem and they can make the change a lot more sticky. Uh, if if you just taught somebody once and walk away, they'll go back to their normal mode. So yes, it it requires a little bit of from the students, uh, from from the outside uh, uh, players, such as uh, the college and such. Okay. Um, what kind of projects or startups did the students do? The the one I did in Trivandrum, I set a theme. Uh, the theme was medical devices. So uh, actually, I have a couple of programs. I, I'll, I'll talk about it. So uh, they had to go out, look for uh, medical me health-related issues in the field. They went to small primary co health centers and uh, mental, f f co f f you know, f f f f f hospitals and, and such. And they had to observe a lot, come back, and, and some of them were in actually in tears, looking at the kind of condition that, that actually happens in, in a government hospital you know, in India. And uh, they came back, they were kind of driven. They did design products. I can maybe, let me see if I can, in the backup slide, I have a couple of them. Uh, some of these cases, uh, they realize in, in India, in a, an outpatient, uh, 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 in a small village, a doctor sees about 200 patients a day. You know, that means doctor sits and the patients come to them. You know, it's like an assembly line. And these are out, outpatient, you know, outpatients. So when they come, uh, you, the doctor does, actually doesn't have any history of these people because they just walk in, they do not know what medicines they were taking and any, any such thing. So there is a lot of problem where you could actually uh, prescribe medicines that may actually hurt them or they may be double taking medicines and things like that. So these kids looked at this problem and said, no, what is missing is that the doctor cannot see. First thing, doctor doesn't know who's actually in front of him till uh, the person is in the patient is in front. Second, the doctor has absolutely no records of all the previous uh, medical records of the student uh, of the of the patient, and they did not want to go into me digital medical records and, and such. So they created a, a cell phone based uh, uh, scanner with a of uh, uh, that is tied to their Aadhaar unique ID that India has today. So the patient can. Well, show the ID and the previous images of all the previous records show up. So at least the doctor can see uh, what was done before, you know. So they created something like that. Uh, this is uh, when they talked to uh, patients, they found that the, the nurses were not actually responding fast enough. And when they go to the nurses, they said, you know, just to put in an IV, it takes me five minutes because I have to keep turning the knob till I have the right number of drops, you know, milliliters per minute. And I have to set it, use a watch to set the, you know, measure it, then correct it and, and such. So these kids came up with the, this is all 3D printed and, and the, what, the box that you see there. Uh, they were looking at, uh, lo looked at a light beam which is being interrupted by the drops and uh, they were using a servo motor. They change the the, uh, the valve up and down, so they can dial up, you know, 75 milliliters per minute or whatever, and it will automatically go there and it will tell the, uh, you know, alarm. So if before the the valve gets over, or, I mean the IV gets over, and 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 such. This is all made from scratch, and this is a very interesting uh, project that they did. It is a boot that the baby wears to look for. Uh, SIDS, or I should sleep apnea, 
you know, sudden infant death syndrome is, I believe, caused by uh, sleep apnea in children. So this one has uh, f uh, f uh, f uh, some LEDs to uh, to measure blood oxygen content, and if the content drops, then it, uh, the baby actually has about 40 seconds or so where it holds the breath, and, and 50 seconds it, it could die. And uh, here it is constantly monitoring the the blood oxygen content of the neonate, and they put in a little vibrating motor on the foot so you can tickle the baby awake and maybe alarm and things like that. So that's the kind of these are all from real problems they found in the industry and you know in the in the field and they came back and created these things and uh, you know and there are several others. Uh, this is from the other place, but most of them are uh, they're all rural agriculture related or uh, you know their industry related projects. Thank you. Um, we have a number of other questions. Okay. One is uh, the next one is from Mohan. Why do you think that most of the entrepreneurs, at least in the United States, are from the big schools? For example, Larry Page, Bill Gates, Zuckerberg. What does that say, or does that doesn't that say something? I think it absolutely proves my point about the confidence. You know, I, I, you know, in in MIT, I, we. we Students, it's a, when you talk about the ecosystem, an undergrad student who joins in, in, in his dorm, his or her dorm, what they see are other students starting companies. So for them, that ecosystem, that is the norm, and that is what the ecosystem builds for them. And, uh, you know, the colleges I went to India, when I asked them about starting a company, they just repel, you know, because they are scared of it. For them, that is not a norm at all. So, an ecosystem building the right ecosystem can change the the emergence of entrepreneurs from these colleges. Great. Um, I love this next question. I don't normally editorialize. I can't help it here. It's from Hunter Hastings, who says, "What about students who don't qualify for college? Can ecosystems be built in high schools or among?" Working class communities. Oh, absolutely. So, so I, I <laughs> so this is nothing to do with college. Actually, the people that you just mentioned, they dropped out of college. You know, you, you talked about Bill Gates and such. It is nothing to do with college. It is to do with uh, can you uh, nurture them early on, where they can take uh, these kind of risks. I tell my other students at MIT that I can take 100 students in any of these colleges and 100 students in in, from MIT and do a smartness check if there is some, I'll see they both would become, come back exactly the same. But the biggest difference is uh, exposure or you know, of, uh, experience. So in uh, the kids I've met in, in, in India, when I've, they have not been exposed to a lot of other things. But most of these kids, through their ecosystem, have been exposed to a lot of things. So when here, when I say A, B, C, they can already figure out D, E, and F. And in India, I don't see that because they have not been exposed to it. It's nothing to do with intelligence, nothing to do with capability. It is a question of catching them early. Okay. Um, there's some more wonderful questions here, Raj. Get ready. Um, thank you for the nice presentation that validates your curriculum and your approach to learning. Can we, can we get more information on the curriculum? That's the first part of the question. The second is, do you have plans to roll out incubators across the world? Okay. Uh, I'm currently working with uh, some universities, some regional and uh, nation, national governments, government bodies to pick up, uh, build these kind of things. Uh, Incubator, let's actually look, take, take a step back. My goal is not to incubate companies, but to incubate entrepreneurs. So they need to, uh, you know, because we all think about companies first and we ha don't actually spend enough time to see, are they uh, mature, are they being trained to take on uh, the responsibility of starting a company? So, uh, of course, once you incubate entrepreneurs, you can always incubate companies. And uh, yes, there is a whole program. Actually, I'm going tonight. I'm teaching at uh, IIT Bombay uh, for next month. 
I even opened a small innovation center in India where I felt I will go uh, for two weeks every two months and I stay with my students. So students can come from all over. I found a, a building. So we stay 24-7 in the same building. We are always working on projects and such. So, you know, mentoring is what actually I want to build. And then they will do the rest. These kids are very smart. They can actually do the rest. It's a question of building the, uh, yeah, uh, eco, you know, uh, their uh, confidence. So the uh, answer to your question is yes, there is a curriculum. Uh, for, but the curriculum is, is it's like a you know, written song. You know, it is the music which actually makes a difference. So it's a question of how you take this curriculum and teach them, uh, you know, with background in product design and entrepreneurship. And I can dig back to my, my past and help uh, interpret things better. Uh, so it is not like a course that they have to take. Go ahead. Great. Um, this is from Jeff Stapperstein. Do you believe grand challenges from Google, IBM, and others could be utilized to provide tools to learn and projects with industry mentors to work on that could spur entrepreneurship on real projects with tools, with clients, with feedback? In other words, could not entrepreneurs be developed through global projects on learning platforms? It Quick thought is that, you know, a top-down approach with larger programs and money and such, it is a pull system where people who want to do these things, they will be more attracted and they will actually go start companies. But my take is that there is a thousand of them left behind for every one of them who takes on this. So we should create a push system where we go to the bottom and inspire them to be ready to take on something like this. So I'm not saying one is better than the other, but we need both in these cases. You know, if if they create, if I create, a, inspire these students to go do things, they need to have something to do after that. So we need to also have all the programs from the top. Okay, this, thank you. This is from Nabil. How about a joint Indian-Pakistani effort to build the innovative the innovation and entrepreneur ecosystem, and also strengthening ties among, among a young generation of future business leaders across borders. I would love to hear your thoughts. I am an American of Pakistani heritage. Fantastic. This is the same. Uh, once uh, all the differences that people see almost you know, disappear when we, once people start working together. And I believe, uh, you know, that's, I would love to uh, interact, Nabil, if you, know, if you have my email address, I'd love to you know, hear from you. And we should actually pick up this discussion. And um, I'll just add, um, in the follow-up email that you'll get later this week, not only will you have a link to the webinar recording and the slides, but um, I will also include Raj's um, email address so you can contact him directly. Oh, um, it's, it's already there on every slide. Well, <laughs> I think I'm I put it. It. Okay, you said it did. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, once you, this is from Adam. Once you start to develop a few entrepreneurs in a rural environment, uh, like my organization currently has done. I don't know what organization okay. that is. How do you suggest attracting required resource, resources such as specialty manufacturing, capital distribution, et cetera? You know, I, I think if you have a critical mass of entrepreneurs, they will find their way. I, I, I you know, it will be great to have uh, 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 all the resources provided, but I think, you know, if there, are, for example, how, if you study the history of uh, Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley was built by entrepreneurs themselves. You know, there was no government policy, there was no, nobody came and set up all these things. People who started building, uh, starting companies, they realized that I don't have anyone to make this knob for me or this, this widget. And they asked someone, can you make it for me? And then if that big guy became the widget maker for the rest of other companies that started. So, uh, and 
uh, you know, they started working together and uh, they built the ecosystem from ground up. So it would be great to provide some of these things, but I think if you put enough uh, uh, entrepreneurs on the ground, they will find a way. Okay. Um, I believe you already spoke to this, but there might be something else you would like to add, Raj. It's from Guy Parmenter, who asks, how have the students done once outside of the university system? Oh, I just finished the program uh, only by June, you know. So I think of all the students, I've had maybe four students who came out, uh, who graduated. Uh, they were in the senior students and such. And I am in, in touch. Actually, I get on WhatsApp and you know, Facebook and such. I get about five, six messages a day on their thinking about different projects and different businesses. And I can see that their their mind is you know always turning. Some of them, you know, of course, they went and took up jobs, but I can see their mind is you know still churning uh, to think up of how to, what to do next. So once you fire up these kids, I don't think they'll ever take a desk job, you know. And and uh, you know it is good or bad, but uh, you know they may do that for a little while, but they finally they follow their heart. Well, that segues very nicely into the next question, which is from Amit Kumar. It's good and impressive to train students early to take um, to learn about entrepreneurship, but how do you train and convince other people around them, like parents, friends, teachers, <laughs> society in general, to understand that failure is part of learning and not leaving things behind? The biggest fear often comes from these people's reactions within the ecosystem. And, and I, can, I should tell you this uh, case, where I was, when I was teaching uh, my first session, which was for six weeks, I, you know, students signed up not because they said they would want to be entrepreneurs, because it, it was a MIT program that was offered, so they signed up for that. So halfway through the program, uh, of course, they were started telling their parents that I think I want to start companies. And I got a call from my from the principal of the college saying parents are calling me saying you know what are you doing these kids now they say they want to go start companies you know and I asked the uh, principal to please you know hold on till the end of the program you know don't connect me to them yet you know because and but the change that the student went through where a student went before that was bored out of his head because uh, you know. In the classes where the schools are taught, basically, teach the syllabus, make an exam, write an exam, give your degree, kick them out, and go find a life for yourself. And what these kids found was there was something very different. And that the, the parents started seeing that in their behavior, in their the way they wake up in the morning and they want to do things and such. And because the parent actually came and told me, the same parent who was complaining. They came for the final uh, demo day where they showed all the pitch, you know, all the products, and they actually pitched and things like that. And said, "I didn't, you know, they did not expect these kids to actually go through this kind of a transformation." So, uh, I think hang on there, hang in there. You know, they will actually see the see the change. And again, it's a matter of law of critical mass. Once more people around you start doing things, we think that is a norm. Okay then even parents and the society would also take that as a, that is a common thing to do. Great. Okay, and um, our last question is from Jose De Mayo, who writes, what do you think is more important as a uh, shift to success? The entrepreneur's efforts, the technology slash innovation, or the access to incubation tools and capital funds? I would put something else at the top. I would say identifying the real problem. So uh, at MIT, you know, unfortunately, I see this is a lot of startups thinking, starting with technology, looking for a problem. Okay, and it is a very common theme in most of the engineering colleges and such. You may start seeing that. I have this great technology. Let me apply it to some, you know, something. If, solve some first world problem. Uh, but the way I tell my students is that if you do not know what your problem is, if you do not know your, all your uh, the customer who's 
you know suffering through this what would they give to pay solve this you know there are, once you know exactly what the problem is then comes multiple ways to solve it and the technology may apply in one way or the other but technology comes much later in the picture than identifying the real problem so i don't know if i'm answering the question so uh, i i think all of them need to be there you know investors and everything else but i would tell uh, success of, a, of an entrepreneur really comes from understanding the problem first excellent um raj i'd like to thank you for an incredibly wonderful webinar that can make a real difference in people's lives. Thank you. thank you. And I'd like to thank all of you for the wonderful questions and for your interest. And I hope you see how applicable this can be across industries, across uh, segments of um, industries as well. Um, this is the conclusion of the 2014 webinar series. The next webinar uh, will be in late January. And we will be sure to send you um, an email alerting you. We um, also, as a reminder, will be sending you a link to the slides, to the web, uh, webinar recording, and to Raj's email address. Uh, wishing you a wonderful holiday season, and thanks again for your support.